Good evening and welcome to Refreshing Views Observatory. I'm Mark Radici. Now one of the projects I've been following over the recent months is the apparition of Venus. It's been a really stunning view from my observatory up, up in England. And Venus has been visible for a good few hours in, into the evening as the sky's got dark, shining in a bright beacon in the evening sky. And I'm recording this, uh, it must be about sort of seven o'clock now. And as you can see, the sky is still quite blue. Um, I've got some clouds drifting in front of Venus itself. This is my western horizon. And Venus is only briefly visible between these two trees. I've got to be quite careful, quite precise with my timing. So I set up nice and early and then wait for Venus to transit in that little gap between the trees, capture my image files, and then go and process them while I wait for the sky to get dark. So what I thought would be quite a good thing to do then would be just to talk you through my process. You're welcome to use that as you see fit. Welcome to plagiarise it or just use the information and, and find out what works for you with your equipment and with your settings. So luckily Venus is relatively easy to find even against this evening sky. I swing the telescope around using the go-to and it's easy to find in the, in the finder scope um, or even in the binoculars even against this uh, evening sky like this. Obviously, the most important task is making sure the sun is well out of the well out of the field of view. You don't want to be looking at the sun through any sort of optical instrument. It's not going to do your eyes any good, and it's not going to do your camera any good as well. So please make sure the sun is well out of the way. You don't want to even for a moment look at the sun through a finder scope or through the telescope itself. Very important. So let's talk about the setup I've got here. I've got a C11 on an EQ6. I've got the motorized focus as well, which makes focusing so easy when the image is jumping around in poor seeing, uh, just to be able to have hands-free, vibration-free focusing. I've got an ASI 224 one-shot color camera, and I've got the infrared filter screwed into that, the infrared cut filter, so I'm shooting in, in the optical wavelengths. So I'm shooting in, in the natural white light. So I use a times two Barlow to get myself up to f20. Now between the Barlow and the camera I've got this thing here with these funny levers that's an atmospheric dispersion corrector it's the ZW atmospheric dispersion corrector and this is designed it has prisms inside that counteract the effect of the atmosphere. Now if you look at Venus through a telescope you'll often see that the lower limb the one nearest the horizon is a deep red and the one above it is a blue and that's a natural effect of the Earth's atmosphere acting like a prism chromatic dispersion. And what this does is you align the levers up, you align the handles up in just the right way to counteract that effect and to realign the red and blue so the light is parallel again. And last but not least, obviously we've got the laptop itself and we're going to use that to capture the video files from the camera. And it's obviously the night of the BAA webinar, so I've got my iPad here as well, so I can listen to the talk as I capture these images as well. So once we've got Venus lined up on, on the finder scope, I use the telescope's EQ6's go-to command to do that. Um, got it roughly in the field of view and then use the hand controller to line up nicely. Of course, if you haven't got a, a go-to setup, you may have to wait a while for the sky to become dark and for Venus to become easier to see. And then it's a matter of using the hand controller, getting it nicely centered as well. And then having a look at the laptop screen, making sure you can then see Venus on the screen as well. Now, if you haven't got your focus in the right place, the first thing I always do is whack the gain up to as high as it can possibly go. And then you'll start to see, hopefully you'll get a donut of light that you can then start to focus down as well, get a nice sharp crescent. And that's where you'll see the value of having a motorized focuser without having the telescope jiggling all over the place as you touch it. So once we've got a nice sharp focus, the next thing to do is then use the atmospheric dispersion corrector, the ADC, get those levers in the right place. Now it's a bit of a tricky art to do that. The first thing you've got to do is make sure that the ADC is lined up so the white lever here, which I've set up beforehand, is nicely horizontal. And I use the walls of the observatory to line up to make sure that's done. Some of the newer ones have spirit levels on built in as well, so you can get that set up. Now, with the image focused on fire capture, I've then adjusted the levers and I use this little setting here, which is it highlights the red and the blue and the differences. And I adjust the levers until I can get the white circle and the red circle to be as close as they possibly can. And try and get those numbers as small as I can. It's a real fiddly uh, operation. I don't really like it because 
as you move the levers, uh, moves the field of view around. So then you have to realign the telescope. And then as you move Venus around on the camera chip, it seems to move the circles again. So you're patting your head, rubbing your tummy. It's changing the focus at the same time as well. So one of the things I'm experimenting with is using a flip mirror, which is shown in this image here. And what this is, is a device you put between the ADC and the camera and has a mirror inside it that reflects light up to the eyepiece. And I then use that to judge when I can't see any red and blue and then flip the mirror out of the way and the light then goes straight through to the camera. Uh, it's much, much easier than trying to use the fire capture settings. I don't really like that. I just can't seem to get on with it. And so using the Mark 1 eyeball is a lot easier. And of course, the good thing about having the flip mirror as well is it allows you to um, find Venus as well and get it nicely centered in the field of view. And then you flip the out of the way, flip the mirror out of the way, and the light goes straight through to the camera. So with Venus nicely focused in the field of view, we've got our atmospheric dispersion corrector set up. We've aligned it so it's horizontal. The halfway line, the white lever is horizontal. We've got the levers set up either by eye using the camera, so either by eye using the eyepiece or by using the red and blue circles in fire capture, trying to get those as close down as we can. It's then a case of adjusting the histogram. Now we want the histogram to be around about sort of 60% or thereabouts um, so that the image is not too dark and it's not too oversaturated around 50 to 60 percent tends to work out quite well now venus is so incredibly bright i'm shooting the exposure rate is very low and then i just adjust the gain down as well and then adjust the gain so that we've got the histogram as around about 60 percent and then i capture 10,000 frames and each between each image sequence i capture what I'm doing is then deliberately defocusing the image and then going back and trying to make sure I can get that limb of Venus absolutely as sharp as I can. Just doing it by eye, I'm not using any mask or focusing gaze, it's just by eye. Just defocus and then refocus and then capture another 10,000 frames. And then I'm hoping that one of the frames is absolutely perfectly nailed, absolutely nailed the focus and that the seeing will be quite good as well. So after a few minutes, then refocusing and checking the focus each time and making sure we've got the histogram at around about 60%, we should have four or five video frames of four, four or five sets of video frames of Venus. And that's normally all I have time for because I have such a li limited window with Venus descending between these two trees. So obviously you'll have a better horizon than me. You'll have more time to do this. So the next thing we need to do then is open up Auto Stack It 3, which is the software tool I use to stack up my video frames. And I open up the each of the files. I set the image, stabiliz image stabilization to planet and I leave the quality estimator at its default, leave that on level four and then press analyze. Make a quick cup of tea while it crunches through those, those video frames. So once the Auto Stacker has finished crunching through the frames. We were then presented with the quality graph. Now it's sometimes worth looking at that. That being said, I don't really bother with it. Regardless of what the graph says, I will always stack 500 and 1,000 or sometimes 2,000 video frames, regardless of what the quality graph says. Um, so some people use it and they use that to judge how many frames they really could get to pull the best out of it. I tend to be a bit lazy and no matter what the graph says, always just stack 500 and 1000. So the other thing we've got to do as well is set up our alignment points. Now, auto stack it through what it's doing in the mass is it's breaking the image down into lots of little squares and it's looking for the sharpest little square in all those little video frames, putting out the sharpest details and then stacking them all back together and then recombine. So it's a bit like a jigsaw. So what you have to do is then tell auto stack at how big to make those those frames and these are the settings I use what am I at 88 pixel size so 88 by 88 size squares which gives me 14 alignment points you don't want to, have to be too small otherwise the software struggles to recombine them back together and you end up with sort of crazy paving sort of look sort of mosaic look but likewise you don't want them to be too big uh, if they're too big you're not going to be able to pull out the sharpest of the details because the pixel size is simply too big so I manually draw those on, just dot them on like you can see there, just following them around. Make sure you've got a nice good overlap there so the image can be all stacked back together again. 
and then it's simply a case of typing in 500 and 1000 to the number of frames you want to stack and then you hit the stack button and then again go away and make another cup of tea and come back when they've all finished so having stacked the video frames we now have a uh, an image file that's a composite of uh, a stack if you like of 500 of those sharpest frames and i open them up in ready stacks 6 which again is a free software tool and ready stacks when you open up a video file you select a video file you you're presented with this screen as a number of blue sliders if you move those to the right and sharpen up the image they produce a lot of hidden detail and the downside of that of course if you sharpen things up you also amplify up the noise and so therefore we need to increase the denoise function as well now it's a bit of an art a bit of a black art really to sharpening uh, images in in registers using the wavelets there's no sort of real right or wrong way to do it so there's a hundred different methods you can find and with venus it doesn't really have certainly in the optical wavelengths a lot of surface features it's a pretty featureless disc so i just tend to use these settings i only use the top two channels uh, numbers one and two and uh, i have a fairly strong denoise there on the left hand side and then sharpen them up uh, uh, as you can see with those numbers there so that's what i use that works on on the on the c11 with the times two barlow with that camera um you're welcome to try those those settings and see how you get on with those so the other thing i do as well in registax is i use the red and blue alignment tool and if you remember earlier we did our best with the atmospheric dispersion corrector to line the red and the blue uh, channels up so that we correct for the effect of the atmosphere's uh, uh, atmospheric dispersion and there's a tool here that allows us just to do that little fine tuning here so you click on the rgb align and set the show area button put the green square over the whole disk of venus and press estimate and it crunches away and you can then uh, it sort of fine tunes up you get rid of that red um, and, and blue sort of hin uh, fringe you get on the atmosphere on the atmosphere of venus so it gives a nice cleaner image it just makes up that last little different from from the adc um so that's the image pretty much done what i also like to do is because i'm imaging against a light sky uh, if you remember on that earlier picture of these it's not dark yet so uh, I open up Photoshop and adjust the levels and I move the dark slider the darkness slider just so it's just touching the the peak of the sorry the left hand side the lower edge of the uh, Venus channel so I don't want to lose any of the phase of Venus I'm not trying to lose any of the of the surface details that we can see I just want to clip that bit there and that just makes the background sky look darker it gives it a sort of more pleasing effect and that's all there is to it that's how i go about capturing a an image of venus using my telescope in the early part of 2020 so i hope you've enjoyed that feel free to plagiarize and use those settings that i use see how you get on with those or adapt them to your own setup as you see fit